Okay, thank you, brother. Second Timothy chapter 2. We'll start reading from verse 14. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the, the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also useful, youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instruct, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. This morning I wanted to talk about verse 15, not directly, but verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're called to rightly divide the word of truth. This morning I want to talk about the opposite of that, not rightly dividing the word of truth. But before I do that, it's important for me to always put in remembrance the importance of, first of all, reading the Bible. You know, if you're going to study the Bible, you have to read the Bible. You have to know what the Bible says to study it. It's like uh, Peter says in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. And I was thinking about that verse this morning. And, uh, you know, just think about how often... We eat every week, you know, usually three times a day about. That's, that's a lot. That adds up over time. You know, that's regular physical food. But how, how often are we eating spiritual food? You know, sometimes we can fool ourselves into thinking that just coming to church, you know, on Sunday, and that's, that's good enough, you know. Once a week, that's good enough. But ask yourself, is it, is it good enough for you to only eat once a week? Can you, imagine, can you imagine that, just eating once a week? No, you eat every day, multiple times a day, of course. So then why isn't the same true for the Word of God and for that spiritual food that we need to grow as Christians? Because if you're a Christian, we're called to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not called to be stagnant and to stay immature babies forever. We're supposed to grow. And how do we grow? We grow by reading God's word. And so, just so, as a way of reminder of the importance of the word of God and of reading it and of making it a part of our lives, our daily lives, you know, not just a once a week thing, not just a when I go to church thing, but reading the Bible every day because it's important, especially if you want to study it, because you want to study it, you have to know what the Bible says. <laughs> to be able to study it. But that's how we grow as Christians, by reading God's word. Because again, what is our salvation? What is Christianity? Christianity is a relationship with the true and living God. That's what, that's what it is. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. He said, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the one true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It's a relationship with God. God wants us to know him. 
And the only way we're going to do that is by reading his word. That's where we get to know God, through his word. And so as a way of encouragement, if you're not reading his word, I encourage you, start reading the Bible. There was a testimony from our brother uh, a couple weeks ago when he made a commitment to read the Bible every day. And uh, when, he, when he shared this, it, was, it had been like two or three weeks already. He said that it had changed his life. Just reading the Bible every day, you know, being committed to reading the Bible every day, once a day. And he said that, that that alone changed his life for those, you know, two or three weeks that he was doing it. Lord willing, he, he's still doing it. But it's, uh, it's important for us to understand that, the importance of God's word and, and reading the Bible. But not just that, it's our approach to God's word. You know, how do we approach the Bible? And I want to look at a verse in Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2, let's look at verse 3. It says, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. When we approach the word of God, we have to come with an open mind seeking the truth. And that's difficult in the world we live in today because truth has become a subjective thing. You know, thanks to relativism. Everybody has their own truth, you know. And we have to approach the word of God seeking God's truth and the, and the things that God has for us from his word. Not the things that make us feel good, not the things that, you know, will, will agree with what we believe already, but the things that God says and his truth and his word. And it's important that we approach God's word that way because sometimes we approach God's word looking for stuff that, you know, agrees with us when it should be the other way. <laughs> we should be looking to agree with the things that God says in his word. The second thing is in, in Psalms 25. I've mentioned this before. Psalms 25. Let's see. Verse 8 says, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. If you don't come to God with humility, <laughs> you're not going to learn anything, and he's not going to be able to guide you. Again, pride acts like a wall, like a brick wall, and you can't pass through it. You know, just like I can't run through the wall here, you can't, pride won't let you get through to understand the things of God and for God to be able to guide you and to show you his word because you're making it all about you that's what pride does it's all about you and we need to make it about all about God and his word and what he wants for us his will and so that, that's our way to approach God's word humility and with an open mind seeking the truth okay that's just a, as a a way to generally look at the Word of God, and again, an, an important reminder to read the, the Word of God, because if we're not reading the Word of God, what is us? But let's go to Second Timothy. Excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Second Peter. Second Peter. Let's look at verse. Verse 14, it says, Wherefore, beloved, 2 Peter, verse, excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless, and account that the longsuffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before or already, beware, 
lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Here in verse 16, it talks about they that are unlearned and stable rest or twist the scriptures. And that's what I wanted to speak about this morning, the twisting of the scriptures, the, the, the twisting of the word of God. And why do I want to talk about that? Because right now we're studying Galatians on Wednesdays. And the, the premise of the letter of, of Galatians is the fact that Paul came to Galatia and he preached to them the true gospel. And now after he's left, he's learned that they're following a false gospel. And what happened? What happened was that people came into the church they infiltrated the church, and they started convincing the church and luring them away with a false gospel. So that he writes the letter of Galatians to them and says, what happened? You know, you've fallen away to another gospel, and that's not even another gospel because there's only one gospel. You know, they had been led away to something false from the true. And one of the, you know, I, I wasn't there. I don't know what they were. What, what they were telling them. But I imagine that they were twisting, in some point, the scriptures and twisting the truth to try to manipulate these Christians and lead them away to the false gospel. You know, I think of my own brother. He grew up in the assemblies with me. You know, he, he was the one who took me to Haile Gospel Chapel. And over the course of his life, he was led away to now believing that, you know, it's, it's faith isn't enough. It's faith plus works and a whole mess of other stuff that he has to do. He was led away because he twist, the, there was a twisting of the scriptures, a twisting of the word of God. And they convinced him and they led him away. And so we as Christians, we need to be aware of that. You know, Paul says we, we need, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. And I hope... That has to stand true today. We have to, we have to not be ignorant of Satan's devices and, and the ways that these things happen and these things come to pass. Um, I don't know if you remember, but when, when I talked about the kingdom parables, uh, the last time I preached, I think it was the last time I preached, you know, we went over you know, the enemy of God and how he has imitators and he has infiltrators and they're coming into the church. But what do you think they're doing? They're coming in to lead people astray by twisting the word of God. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning and talk about different ways that the word of God is twisted or manipulated uh, to do that, to lead people away. And sometimes we ourselves fall into that trap of twisting the word of God ourselves, you know. It can happen to us, so we also have to be aware of that because we make mistakes too. We're not perfect. But the, the, I want to talk about some different uh, ways that that happens. And the first way is uh, one of the most obvious. It's called proof texting. And that happens when you take a text of the Word of God out of context and you use it to prove something that you already believe or there's something that, makes, that, that you want or something that you feel. You know, they call that proof texting. I'm going to give you an example. If we go to 1 Corinthians, let's see, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6. Paul is speaking and he says, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. And like I said uh, before on Wednesday, that uh, this, these are scriptures that are used to convey or, or, or to tell people that, you know, Paul, his writings, you know, they're, they're not inspired by God. You know, that he was just writing about his opinion, what he thought, what his feelings were, his judgment. You know, Paul's, Paul's writings, they, they don't come from God. They're just what he thinks. And this is a verse that's used in that. They take the, the verse, they take it out of context, and then they, you know, when, once it's out of context, you can make it mean whatever you want it to mean, you know. But that's what they do, you know. Paul, Paul is one of the most, you know, quote-unquote controversial apostles because of, you know, verses like this, because people take it out of context, and they try to make Paul into just another person who was, you know, sharing his views on things. When, in fact, you know, he's an apostle. You know, that, that's, that's what we're learning in Galatians right now. We haven't gotten there yet. But, 
he establishes his history and the fact that everything he did and all the way up, all through his life, was, came directly from God. You know, he didn't go anywhere to learn anything from anybody. God gave it to him directly, you know. He, he didn't go to, to Jerusalem and learn from the other apostles. No, God, God taught him the things he needed to learn. And, every, and all the doctrine that he taught came directly from God. And we can be sure of that. That's what, you know, we're, we're going through in Galatians chapter 1 right now. That's why God <laughs> had him write that, so we can be sure of that. So when people take this verse out of context and tell us, well, God was just, you know, Paul was just sharing his opinions. We say, no, that's not true. <laughs> In Galatians, he, he establishes that everything that he's saying comes directly from God. So that's proof texting. That's, that's taking things out of context to try to prove, <clears throat> taking a verse out of context or text out of context to try to prove something you're already believers. But, um, and of course, the importance of context, I'm not going to go over it again. We went over it on, on Wednesday. But uh, like I said on, on a Wednesday, you know, text without context is pretext. And pretext is deception. So we always have to Make sure that if we want to understand the word of God, everything has to be in context, proper context and the proper framing to make sure we understand what the God is, you know, what's saying, what God's saying through his word. The next is uh, reverse proof texting. Instead of taking a verse that's there and taking it out of context, it's using a verse that's not there to prove something that you believe or something that you fear, something that you want. Um, I'm going to give you an outrageous example. But hopefully you'll get the point, you know. If I were to say, well, you know, if someone look up in, a, in your Bible study program a verse that says that we can't hijack airplanes, you know, and you say, well, you know, there, there's no verse that says you can't hijack an airplane. I say, see, I got you. That means that, that, that it's okay to hijack an airplane because there's nowhere in the Bible where it says don't hijack an airplane, you see. And that, that would be an example of reverse proof texting, using something that's not there to prove something. And <clears throat> but we learn through other ways that hijacking an airplane is wrong. And because the Bible not only teaches directly, but it teaches indirectly. And I'm going to show you an example of that. If you go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. The last verse, verse 23, says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is an example of direct teaching. It's simple, it's direct, it's plain. The wages of sin is death. It's, it's, you, know, you don't need a, a, a Bible study program to understand what's being said. The wages of sin is that's very simple. That's direct teaching. God is directly telling you something. Now let's look at indirect teaching. Let's go to Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. Let's start reading at verse 24. It says, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. So we see here God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Those of us who are familiar with the story, we can answer the question, why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? You know, but... Let's look at the answer in, ver in chapter 13 of Genesis. Chapter 13 of Genesis, verse 13 says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Because the wages of sin is death. So we see... Two different examples. God directly telling you or teaching you the wages of sin is death in Romans chapter 6. And now God indirectly teaching you that the wages of sin is death here in Genesis because he destroyed Gomorrah, a wicked city full of sin. We see, we see the, the, those, the difference between direct teaching and indirect teaching. 
That's why we just can't come and say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't say, you know, these exact words, so it's okay or not okay or whatever. Because God teaches in different ways. You look at Psalm 119, you know, and God communicates his will to us through testimonies, judgments, commandments, statutes. There's different ways that God communicates his will and what he wants us to know. Okay, not just one way, it's direct teaching. There's different ways he teaches us and communicates to us. You know, we have the whole history in the Old Testament, you know, that Hebrews tells us is there for our admonition, for us, for, for we can learn from it, so we can understand the things and, and the character of God through these things. So that's reverse proof texting. Okay, and so we need to be careful. <laughs> Again, and, and I'm, 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 I'm speaking about these things so that we can be aware and we can know of how the word of God is twisted and manipulated, if you will, or how we ourselves can fall into the error of doing these things and twisting the word of God ourselves, you know, so we can be aware so we don't fall into another, you know, Galatians situation where people came in and they were able to lead people to a false gospel. The next is semantics. And, you know, Ephesians 2.89, I think we know that verse, you know, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And semantics is uh, basically playing games with words, you know, the meanings of words and things like that. That's what semantics is. And arguing over those meanings of words. And you say, Ephesians 2, 89, that, that's, that's a simple verse. We can understand that. But what if I were to say to you, oh, well, you know, it says, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith. And, you know, and it doesn't say by faith. It says through faith. And I started, you know, manipulating and saying, well, you know, if it says it's through faith, you know, it's not of works alone, but through faith, it's works with through faith. And I started, you know, trying to manip manipulate the verse that way, trying to play with the words. That's semantics. You know, we need to be careful with those word games and arguing about those types of things. You know, for another example, you know, if I tell you, you know, you need to repent from your sin, and, you know, what's the difference between these two things? Repent from your sin and repent from your stealing. You know, what's the difference between those two phrases? You know, what is stealing? Stealing is sin. So I'm saying essentially the same thing, you know. But if you take, you know, issue with one over the other, you know, you're playing, you're engaged in semantics because I'm saying essentially the same thing. Repent from your sin or repent from your stealing. That's what semantics is. You know, word games. And we need to be careful from that. The next is uh, authoritative shifting or shifting the authority. And that happens when we take God's word and shift the authority of God's word away from God and onto people, onto man. And um, I don't know if, if, if you ever encountered this, but you, you, you're talking to someone about the Bible and someone says, uh, yeah, I, I believe that or, or, or I know that's true because brother so-and-so says. And I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you. You know, brother so-and-so says, and they're shifting the authority away from God and, you know, they don't believe it because God said it. They believe it because Brother so-and-so said it. They're shifting the authority away from God to a person, to a man. And, you know, of course, let's, let's look at a verse. Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Verse 8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Our trust should be in the Lord. I mean, that goes out without saying, right? In God. Because I don't know if, if what you've encountered in your life, but um, I've, I've learned that, you know, man will disappoint you. People will, will disappoint you. Well, if not now, then later. At some point, you're going to be disappointed by people. They're going to let you down. But God will never let us down because he is faithful and he is true. And so we have to be careful not to shift the authority away from God to people, you know, especially in this day and age where people are enamored with, oh, you know, doctors and lawyers and the scholars say, and we got to do listen to the scholars, you know, 
it's a funny story. It shouldn't be funny. It's sad, really, but it's a funny story. One time, a brother told me, you know, that something in the Bible wasn't true because the archaeologists hadn't discovered evidence of it over in the Middle East. <laughs> and I was, you know, I would have laughed if it wasn't so sad. But it's just so, it, we have to be careful. We have to be careful that we don't shift the authority onto man. And, you know, and just because a man says something, you no, know, what, what does the Bible say? What does God's word say? And leave the authority with God because he's the one <laughs> that we need to trust in and look to because God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't make errors. We can have faith and trust in that what he says is true and will always be true and will always, always lead us in the right direction, on the path of righteousness. So that's authoritative shifting. The next is uh, reading into the Word of God. Don't re- I don't really have a name for this one. Reading into the Word of God. Let's look at Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. It says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So it's pretty clear God doesn't want you to add anything or take anything away. But in this case, we're looking at adding things. And God says something similar to Joshua in chapter 1 of Joshua when he says, you know, stick to my word and don't deviate neither to the right hand or to the left. That's a paraphrasing, of course. But he says something similar to Joshua. You know, and God's word is complete in that it has everything he wants us to know. (laughs) And I say that because there's a lot of things that are missing, you know. A lot of things, sometimes when we read, we say, man, you know, what were they thinking? Or what, 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 was, what was the full situation there? You know, how did, how did they get there in that, in that history? And we need to be careful because our minds tend to wander and we tend to imagine things. And we, we can be found guilty of adding things to the word of God. And we need to be very careful <laughs> of that. You know, when we start characterizing people and characterizing things, you know, adding things. And, you know, the best example I can give you is Lot. In all my years as a Christian in the assemblies, I don't remember ever hearing a message or someone preach about Lot and portray Lot in a positive way. In all my years in the assemblies. Maybe, maybe they did, I just don't remember. But <laughs> it's always been Lot is a bad guy. Lot did bad things. And yet, when God testifies of Lot, you know, in... Second Peter, he says, Lot was, Lot was a righteous man. <laughs> right? And so we need to be careful not to add our own imaginings into the word of God. You know, and it's, it's okay for us to have opinions, to have beliefs, to have ideas. But it's not okay to pass those things off as the word of God and as doctrine. You know, there's a line there. And we have to be careful not to cross it. And unfortunately, you know, there's good brothers who've, you know, they've crossed the line sometimes. Maybe they forget. I don't know. The Lord knows. But they start, they come up to the pulpit and they start, you know, sharing these things that they're not the word of God. Because they're, they're things that, you know, their characterizations, their ideas, their beliefs, etc. And again, it's not wrong to have those things. But we need to be careful not to add things to the word of God. You know, just because something is missing, there's, there's no characterization there, it's Okay. <laughs> It's okay to say we don't know. We don't know. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, God, we have to have faith that everything that's here in the Bible is what God wants us to know. And that if it's not there, he doesn't want us to know it. It's not, it's not important for us. And it's okay that we don't know it. Maybe one day when we get to heaven, he'll explain it to us in further detail and we'll know everything. You know? <laughs> but for right now, we just have to make do with what God has provided us in his word. And be careful not to add extra things to it. You know, reading things into the word of God. Finally, the last example I have this morning. By the way, there could be others. 
I'm just, you know, providing a few. The last is leading questions. And for that, I'm going to go to uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. And uh, I don't know if you've watched, like, uh, you know, Law and Order on TV or some kind of, you know, been in a court case or something like that, but there, there, there's, there'll be a situation where a lawyer is asking a witness questions, and then the other lawyer says, I object, leading, leading the witness. And what they're doing is they're objecting because the questions that are being asked are, are not designed to get information, but they're designed to lead the witness or to lead the person to a certain conclusion. They're designed to manipulate the thinking. You see, it's called a leading question. And here in Mark chapter 14, we have a passage. It says, verse 51. And there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now, I don't know if you've heard this, but there's people who ask, well, what was Jesus Christ doing hanging around with half-naked men? You know, what in the world was that all about? And it's not a genuine question. What they're doing is trying to lead you into the idea that somehow the Lord Jesus Christ was homosexual and that he hung around half-naked men and, and, and that was his thing. You see, because I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are churches now that openly embrace homosexuality and have homosexual, you know, pastors and all, all sorts of things, you know. And so they, they, they ask this question, not a genuine question, but a leading question, you know. They take the scripture and they, and they ask you a leading question, trying to lead you to a certain conclusion. That because of this verse, you know, well, you, 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 you might get, you know, deceived. You might say, well... Maybe, maybe that's true, you know. Why, why was the Lord Jesus Christ hanging out with half-naked men? You know, but of course, that's manipulation, to try to manipulate you into error. Because, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is God, and he is completely perfect and holy and sinless in every way. And homosexuality is sin, and it's unnatural, and it's a perversion, in case you didn't know. That's a leading question, you know. And so we need to be careful of all, the, all of these different things and ways that the word of God can be twisted to lead us away. Because again, you know, we're studying Galatians. And it's important because that's, that's the premise of the book. You know, Paul starts off the book with that, you know. I preached the gospel to you. And what happened? You've, you've fallen away to a false gospel. You know, which is not a gospel because there's only one gospel, the true gospel. And, you know, that happened in Galatia, Galatia way back when. And the same thing can happen here. The same thing can happen anywhere, you know, because, again, Satan, it says, is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't take a break. He's always looking to destroy your life, to destroy the things that God builds up. That's, that's his purpose. That's what he wants to do. You know, Satan doesn't have mercy on anyone. And so we have to be aware. We have to be, like, uh, like we mentioned a, a while back, to walk circumspectly, not as fools to have awareness, to, to understand what's going on, you know, to understand what's going on in the church, you know, and not to be ignorant of these things. Like Paul said, you know, not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. And of course, it all starts by reading his word. And if we're not reading his word, you know, how are we going to know these things? How are we going to learn these things? So if you're not reading his word, once again, I encourage you, please, Get into the habit of reading the Bible every day and making it a part of your life every day. Not just a once a week thing, not just a when I remember thing, but make it a point to make the word of God a genuine integral part of your life. Because if not, you know, how are you going to grow in the things of the Lord? How are you going to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? You're not. It's that simple. And here's a question. Are, are you okay being an immature spiritual baby for the rest of your life? Is that okay with you? I mean, it, I hope not. I hope you want to grow and to mature in the things of God. And that's only done by reading his word 
and studying it and, and enjoying all the things that God has for us through his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this time that you've given us in your holy word. We pray you'd help us, Father, to have a commitment, to have a desire, to have a need, a hunger for your holy word, Father, and to read it and to make it a part of our lives. So we would not be caught off guard, Father, when people try to twist the truth and try to lead us astray, but that we would be aware, that we would walk circumspectly, Father, that we would know what's going on around us because we're grounded in your word, in the truth of God. We thank you, Father, for this time once again. We thank you, Father, for everyone who made it out. We ask your blessing now and ask you to take us home safely. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray.